bison to sheep and beef to nurseries, market gardens, viticulture, you name it. And sometimes I feel like I'm just doggy paddling to try and understand what people are talking about with their specific sector, but what joins all of that is our soil, right? So let's talk a little <coughs> bit about what regenerative agriculture is. So one of the arguments um, that I hear is that we're going back in time. You know, regenerative agriculture means we do what our great-great-grandparents were doing before the Green Revolution. And so I like this definition by Norman Uphold, who says that postmodern agriculture is not anti-science. It's the most modern agriculture because it builds carefully and creatively on advances in scientific knowledge, particularly in the disciplines of biology, ecology, and microbiology. This is why it's so exciting to be here with Jonathan and just geek out all right, at <laughs> some of the really fun stuff that we're seeing in soils. So we're seeing a whole world of science opening up into agriculture. All right, so how do we define that regenerative agriculture? Can I get some ways that you communicate this with people? Ties up carbon. Sorry, so we're sinking carbon into the soil? Yeah. <coughs> increasing biological life in the soil. Yeah, increasing the vibrancy and aliveness of our soils. Doing things so you can keep doing things. Yeah, that would be awesome, wouldn't it? Yeah, <laughs> like, let's do stuff, we're going to keep going. Yeah. Oh, restoring soil ecosystems and soil life. Soil life, ecosystems, yeah. Build soil. Sorry? Build Build soil. Building soil, yeah. In a, in a um, intensive, bio-intensive crop row system, mm -hmm. I'm trying to disturb the soil as least as possible <laughs> right. to keep it intact, to basically enable or steward the soil to allow it to do what it will do naturally. Fantastic. Oh, yeah, so amazing. restoring that function. Turning <coughs> nutrients to food. Putting nutrients, so putting food quality back into food. Very mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Support bees. Oh, bees, yeah. Bees. You like the bees. Maximizing functionality. Yeah, so like, let's bring function back into the system. So we're currently facing like the perfect storm of all sorts of different aspects that are coming together right now, from climate variability to declines in soil. We just don't have food quality happening in food anymore, things are contaminated and all that. You know, we're really facing what can seem very overwhelming, and at the same time it seems like we need to be overwhelmed in order to change tracks because we can't continue to what, continue what farming has become because it's not working. Right? So the literature defines regenerative agriculture <coughs> as any system of <coughs> fiber with these objectives. So incorporating natural processes, thinking how do I get in sync with nature or what used to grow here or what do these landscapes look like and how do I harness that to ensure that I'm profitable, efficient and producing quality food. Right? Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. or, uh, and the reduced need for inputs, so redu reducing those harmful external inputs, closing the loops, having a system that starts to function without having all this stuff brought in. And if you are using inputs, they're very targeted, they're very efficient, and they feed microbiology. Right? Agree with that? Right. And the producers are the experts. So regenerative agriculture requires the full participation of farmers and those that work on the land. Involved in the problem analysis, the development of technology, adaptation and extension. You guys are the experts. This is not to have people on high telling you how to do this. This is farmers to farmers sharing information about how does this work? How does this work in my context? Would you agree with that? Yeah. It's it's so what I find is regenerative agriculture is a complex system. So Gordon alluded to that. It's not adding something on. I spoke at a conference in Australia and I... I didn't realise, but the sponsor for my session was Bayer. And um, I was like, I'm not with these guys. <laughs> I'm like, uh, but they have a, a bacillus bacterial product that you can add into your system and it can do this amazing stuff. We just have these little silver bullets, right? That is not regeneration, right? That is just substitution, right? We saw that a lot with some of the big, large scale industrial organics, right? It's just substitutional farming. We're not addressing the underlying drivers, right? And it comes down to asking these questions. So we look at, and, and that's what I really loved about what these two guys are talking about, is what are you observing? How do you, you start to notice things with either livestock or plants or soils or water? What is happening? Has my management been part of the problem? Maybe it has been, right? Educating yourself, coming to things like this, Regenerative agriculture is very knowledge intensive. It's not the answer's 200, <laughs> which would be very nice. 
And what you'll find is the answer used to be 200 pounds and now it's 400 pounds, right? It's no longer the answer, right? So we're having to think, we're having to observe, we're having to you know, look at how your environment works. Then management underpins everything. If you don't get this management bit right, you're going to have to put a lot more into the system. You're going to have to spend more money. Right? So management <coughs> is your number one driver for success. We talk about addressing the limiting factors, and I'll touch on that. Feeding microbiology, increasing biodiversity. Right? Have we got more species above and below the ground? We're seeing diversity in microbiology. Are we bringing in, I don't know, chickens or turkeys or other enterprises on top of cattle? Talk about some of the broad spectrum fertilizers, calcium and phosphate. Here in California, you guys have a real limiting factor around calcium. What do you need calcium for? Opening up the soil. Sorry? Opening up the soil. Opening up soil, so creating soil structure, aggregate structure. Cell walls. Green nitrogen. Cell walls, yep, so it's involved in every single cell wall. Green bound nitrogen. Yep, so we get our nitrogen cycle starts to work when you get aggregate stability. You think teeth and nails and hair and all of that, but calcium is the foundation for health and nutrition. And if you're low in calcium, that can actually put a drag on achieving all these goals that we talked about. So it might be something that you need to be looking at if, if what's happening here. And then what I call the refinements, right? And that might be your compost extracts or teas or something. But it works on top of getting things like your management right. Okay? There's no putting some kind of compost tea on top of bad management. Right? <laughs> And you can do it all the time. Yeah. Oh, but I'm putting teas on. <laughs> you know, you need more than one cow wandering around by itself. <laughs> all right. Underpinning all of this is your mindset, right? If you don't get your mind, and it's quite interesting writing the book, because what I really came to realize is the difference in having a reductionist, quantitative mindset to a qualitative mindset. And what that means is people that are really interested in how do I, how do I improve like quality of life in my family, like looking at reductions in stress, having profitable systems that are, that are profitable more than just money in your bank account, but a system that has resilience, right? And the questions that those people ask is very different. It doesn't become, well, how much yield am I gonna get? Because yield doesn't mean anything if it's not profitable. Right? It becomes a question of um, thinking about that whole system, right? So I was working with a, a cropping seed producer in New Zealand. And he said, look, this regenerative stuff's not working. He's like, I'm using these biological, um, you know, like inputs and I'm buying packaged products, it's not working. So I said to him, can you show me where you've been doing that for at least three years in the same place? Oh no, I haven't done that. So I'm like, okay, so what are you looking for? And all he was looking for was yield. And I asked him, what's your program? Well, I do a pre-herbicide neonicotinoids on the seed, we love that, uh, post-emergent herbicide, six fungicides, and that's atrazine to kill it down. But I'm putting the biologicals in. Camostel is biological. No, mate, you can't. Right. And he asked me at the end of the day what I thought his limiting factor to production was. I said, your attitude. <laughs> I did. I did. I felt terrible. But you know what? <laughs> it changed his operation. And he's now doing an amazing job doing a regenerative seed production. And people are going to him for information. So he's had 10 years of learning. And he had to learn to let go of the side of the swimming pool and start swimming. Because right? he was too scared to let go of the fungicides and the pesticides. Right? But it was the mindset for him that nothing was going to work. I'm doing these biologicals, nothing's working. You know, if you think you can, or think you can't, you're right. <laughs> yeah. And so I find the mindset starts to shift as people start to regenerate, as you start to get creative with your thinking. You start to see, where am I responsible? Where is this something that I, can, that I have power in? Instead of, it's the weather, it's Trump, it's whatever. They're becoming these external things. The neighbors, it's the neighbor's fault, it's my wife's fault. <laughs> I can take action here. What's happening on my land is actually a big part of me, right? And being willing to ask that question, right? Which is a big, it's a big deal. So the principles are what underline regenerative agriculture. So having, optimizing what we call plant photosynthesis. Is that plant in optimal health? Is it fulfilling its full genetic potential and pumping sugars out to the microbiology? Have you got a system that that's 
working in. Have you got year-round ground cover? Holy Toledo, the first time I came to California, that was a shock, right, in the middle of summer. Now, interestingly, the thistles are fine, right? So if there's green plants out there, you're missing something. Right? Where are these C4 perennial species? Where are your forbs, right? And getting interested in how do we start to get those back? Because if you have bare ground and soil, your soil health is going to decline. You are going to see more and more compaction. Right? We need a living root year round to be feeding microbiology and keeping those soils open. Reducing disturbance. So what kind of things are disturbance? Tillage. Herbicide. Tillage. Herbicide. Very good. What else? Mm -hmm. Erosion. Huh? Erosion. Mm -hmm. Erosion. Traffic. Traffic. Heavy traffic. Water logging. All right, so notice that some of these things are man-made, some of them are natural. Right? So if we have a disturbance event, can we repair it? So the property that I brought um, in 2009, I dug a hole before I bought it. Who dug a hole in their soil before they bought their property? Mm. Oh, <laughs> very good. <laughs> right. It's very rarely that we find many people that dig holes. You're just paying an absolute fortune for a piece of land, and you don't know what you're sitting on top of. What we were sitting on top of at a six inch depth was a calcium silicate nurse that had blown across from the volcanic region in, in total. Calcium silicate you could buy as a badge product to quick set concrete. So what we had, we could have maybe started another enterprise in quick set concrete, but um, we, had this, we had a concretion layer where water would sit on top when it rained heavily and when it would be, the soils would stink. Right, and go anaerobic, wow. and the animals would make a whole lot of pugging up. Or do you guys call it pugging? That's a new word, pugging, treading damage, right? Um, and then in summer, the water would be underneath that pan, and everything would dry up. So I went right. Let's see if we can just do this with adaptive grazing, with diverse species, with different. We were running pigs, chickens, sheep, cattle, horses. <laughs> Can't say the horses were a big part of our soil rehabilitation program, <laughs> um, but we were doing horse breaking. So what that would mean is a, a, a size of land about this size, we would keep a horse in for six weeks. Right, well it's getting broken in. Now you can imagine how much grass is growing at the end of the six weeks. And what do you think is going to grow when we take those horses off? Weeds, right? And it would grow at a yellow patch. So for us it was... Um, uh, we get different types of thistles, we would get different types of yellow weeds, so like your buttercups and stuff. So what we had was a rehabilitation program. We're like, we have created disturbance, so after a horse comes out, we're going to rehabilitate that. Okay, so it involved some liquid calcium, it involved worm extract, so vermicast we would put onto the land to open it up, and then what would grow would be soft grasses and clovers. But we were going, we are causing a disturbance, we're going to repair that. Okay? So anytime we're creating a disturbance, we're going to do that. By year four, I was questioning my sanity buying this land. Mm -hmm. right? It was hard going. By year seven, that hard pan had totally gone. And the only place it still sat was under the, the under gateways and around the yards. But everywhere else it had totally gone. Right? Water would start to sink in. Our soils are warmer at the start of spring and cooler in the heat of summer. Why is that happening? Transpiration. Transpiration. Biology. Research. Biology doing what? Growing. Growing. They start to create these very aerated, porous soils. Our soils have more air in them than they have soil. <coughs> right? And that's like those straw bale houses. Have you ever been inside one? You know how they're cool in summer and warm in winter? We get these thermal lags where soils will actually stay warm right into that, right through winter and then cooler into summer. Right? We can change that temperature that that soil is experiencing through building that house for microbiology. We're lifting above and below diversity. Now this could include running different types of livestock. Now for some people, livestock is just not going to work. Right? Mm -hmm. It might be a small market garden or vegetable production. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to bring in the manures or some kind of byproduct from, from, from livestock. Right? How do we keep that livestock angle? And I'm sure John's going to talk about this, but thinking about how much diversity comes in from birds and insects. And if you, your bird population dropped by 2.9 billion in the last 10 years, no, 
2.9 billion. Those birds are bringing in guano, they're bringing in phosphate, they're bringing in nitrogen on their feet are protozoa and mycorrhizal spores. They're inoculating landscapes when they land. And you guys have lost 2.9 billion of these little <coughs> these birds that are bringing in life. The insect population's crashed, we're losing nitrogen. And one of the, the most important bioavailable nitrogen forms and 75% crash of insect right. populations, right? So that 75% of nutrient that used to be coming onto your land, how do we bring them back? You know, and it becomes a super fun game of how, where's the diversity? What else could I plant here? What, what else could I attract? And then addressing what I call the limiting factors. <coughs> do I think I talked about? No, I don't. <coughs> so the limiting factors are what I call the that, that, that just the basic limiting factors for life. So what's the number one thing that's going to stop grass growing? Drought, lack of water. Drought, lack of water. Yeah, water, water is really, really important. But there's two things before that. Urban <laughs> <laughs> <Boys> are <coughs> The sunlight, right? So if the sun goes out, we're in trouble, right? We're in big trouble. <laughs> All right, so yes, we need the sun to be pumping that whole system, building life back in the soil, pumping sugars into the soil. Now there's something before water. For the sea things? Right, so think about how long you can survive without water. Three days, maybe? How long without air? <laughs> and most of our soils, what we find, and, and this is particularly good here, California, I really enjoy working here because it's very similar to New Zealand, right? They did a national survey, 80% of New Zealand dairy farms are significantly compacted. If you don't have air moving through that system, nothing else is working. Your water cycles are not working, your nutrient cycle decomposition are not working. So we, call, we address these limiting factors in order. Is that plant photosynthesizing well? Is that soil breathing? Is water coming in? Is decomposition working? And then what's happened with the nutrients? Whereas what happens right now is if you ask an agronomist, where should I start? What are they going to tell you that you need to do? Do a soil test. Do a soil test and then what? Yeah. yeah. 200 pounds. <laughs> Got the answer for you, all right? So they're looking at about step four of a triage of what's your limiting factor. Whereas actually, for most of you, it's compaction. Right? Can we open those soils up? And as an outcome, are we increasing biodiversity? Are we improving water quality? Does the water come rushing to your property full of sediments and it's dirty and does it leave your property clean and pristine? That's the game we're playing, all right? How clean and how good can you get it? <laughs> Are we improving those soil health measures? Is my soil breathing? Right? Do I have aggregate stability? Have I broken up the hard pans? Greenhouse gas reductions. Are you part of the solution? Not the problem. I'm working on a farm or it's the friends of mine in Western Australia, they are sequestering every year the greenhouse gas emissions of 22,000 people. Mm. Wow. How cool is that? Four and a half thousand Americans. Different <laughs> 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 numbers. Right? So 20,000 more people, all right? That they're actually sinking into their land, all right? So that's carbon, that's reductions in nitrous oxide. You are part of the solution now. You need to be measuring this stuff. If you're not benchmarking it, don't assume that this is happening. Are you measuring it? Are you improving food quality? Hands up if you're measuring nutrient density of your food. Very good, let's talk later. <laughs> what I find is people are talking about it. Oh, well, I'm grass fed, so I've got more nutrient de density. No, not necessarily. You need to test it, right? Is your vegetable got more vitamin C or vitamin A or lycopene or whatever it is that you're growing. Are you increasing that? Are you providing food for humans? Right? And then profit and wellness. Are we seeing systems that actually are more profitable? And if you're like, I'm not in it for the profit, you've potentially got a conversation about money that you need to get resolved. Okay? Because this is the world that we live in and all of us are squirrely about money. Right? Because, I don't know, Dad was like that, so I'm going to be the opposite for it. You're greedy if you're this, right? Well, you should be poor because you're Irish. I don't know. <laughs> We've all got these stories that we need to transform. So I did a workshop in Western Australia 
two years ago, and the Minister for Western Australian Agriculture opened my class. It was super exciting, and this is what she said. Regenerative agriculture is the way of the future. Indeed, without it, there is no future for Western Australia. And she predicted five to 10 years, agriculture there's just gonna bomb out. Now, they don't have the wealth, oh, sorry, wealthy. Sorry, subsidy system that you guys have <laughs> in this country, right? So Australia, New Zealand, we don't get paid out, right? You don't grow a crop, you don't get money, right? And Australia was always predicted to, go to, to be the first country to really fall due to climate change, and we're seeing that right now. Right, so this is an image of some of the fires that were happening at the end of December. What are they up to now? 13 million acres? Yeah, larger than Switzerland. Larger than Switzerland, right? Australia is on fire. Now, I was there last February, and I, I how much? You have about 10 minutes. Cool. Alright, and so I was <coughs> from the Grampians, which are here, up to Echuca, so like the big um, cropping areas down to Melbourne, then I drove along here and here and ended up in, Mel uh, in Canberra. I also got a train from up here from Townsville all the way down to Sunshine Coast. Eight hour train ride. This drive was about 18 hours. The entire time while I'm driving, there's no grass. There's cows and sheep that look like leather stretched over little, little skeletons, right? And normally they would be put down, but no one knows what to do because everybody looks like that. That system is so dry, right? So I think this last season, they were 60 degrees warmer than average. And by the time I got to here, I, I, I felt like I was gonna break into tears. Like it was just so emotionally impactful. And then I got to this property. <laughs> it's called Jillamatong. It's owned by a farmer called Martin Royd. <clears throat> what Martin's doing is practicing, oh, I should write it down. Okay, I'm going to have to say it. Natural sequence farming. <coughs> he brought in some of the, so natural sequence farming was invented by Cedar Andrews. Um, he's written two books, Back from the Brink and Return from the Brink, looking at how do we rehydrate these landscapes. When uh, colonials first arrived to Australia, the whole place was a swamp. But they had, they had to really drag everything through all of these, like, what they called the leaky weirs and these water systems that the whole country was just seeping. Right? And it took them, they reckon, two to three years to destroy that ecosystem. Like, we have no idea what Australia actually looked like. So what he's done is he's put in the leaky weirs, he has contours along here, and what he runs is, um, he puts compost in the contours. So if it ever gets any rain, it takes microbiology along the contours and out in the fields. It's super cool to see. Uh, he had a fire. So that, that top bit's actually the neighbors where the fire burns across. And luckily, because he's got this water supply, then the helicopters can put the fire out. Because mm -hmm. there's no rivers, there's no dams, it's all dried up. So the local council has been buying water off him. He's the only one in the region that has any water. Out of the bottom of these weirs, he's producing 5,000 gallons of water a day that starts on his property. But the whole thing's hydrated and it's releasing water. Instead of having these flash flood drought, flash flood droughts that's become normal, that is not normal. That is bad land management. How do we start to put water back where it belongs? Because what's the biggest driver for climate change? Water, right? We're so busy focusing on carbon, which is awesome that people are mentioning carbon at all, so I'm not complaining, but it's water. Water is no longer in these soil <coughs> systems. And while we were driving around, we counted 12 different types of fungi on this place. I was very excited. And then, does anyone know what this is? Cordyceps. Cordyceps mushrooms. <laughs> so they grow it inside a, um, a caterpillar. So there's the mummified caterpillar and there's the fungus that sprouted out of its head. Ooh, so cool. Uh, you might have seen in, at the 2000 Olympics how the Chinese Olympic team uh, were banned, the women's running team, because they were taking this cordyceps. It works for stamina, for heart health. Uh, one other reason that they like to take it is the Chinese think it does, helps with this. Um, yeah. <laughs> with me. All right. Um, <laughs> so these guys have been making a tincture out of this cordyceps and giving it to the local community for free. Apparently it worked and they've been banned from taking it anymore. That's enough. It's an animal, right? So it, it works apparently. So, <laughs> um, so this fungus is worth a fortune, right? And 
you guys have it here in California. Okay? So you have a number of these different, they're called entomopathogenic, ento meaning insect pathogen, which I always thought was disease, but it actually literally means suffering. <laughs> insect suffering organisms that will live in grasshoppers. They will live in, I don't know, what kind of pests have you got out here? Lots and lots of different pests. Yes. So lots of all of them. Yes. Not all of them, but a lot. So what we find is, if you have compacted soils, you don't have these guys. What it requires is a soil that's opened up that has disease suppression abilities. Right? You compact that soil, you lose the diversity of the organisms that control them. <coughs> uh, this one's called Cordyceps gunnii. Yeah. Right? So they're just doing yeah. the research. The, um, the other telophase is called metarhizium. Metarhizium, it, yeah. And it's a, in a common, it was a commonly available fungal pathogen um, insect control. Yeah, so they're using metarhizium, so another type of entomopathogenic <coughs> fungi to spray it on bees to control varroa mites. Yeah. Oh. Right, so it doesn't hurt the bee. Um, you can like leave it in a plate, and the bees, when they walk in their hive, will take it up, and it'll actually infect and create that kind of effect on mites. They turn up with metarhizium. It's also known as green muscadine disease. They're all fuzzy and green. They're super fun. And what I find is if we're seeing organisms like this and like on your properties, you can take like about six of them, borrow the neighbor's blender, and put it into suspension, and that would be enough to then spray onto an acre of soil. Wow. Yeah, super fun. So this photo here is from Kim Deans, who's one of my Australian team members. They had a fire go through in January, so what you're seeing is the result of the fire. Okay, so there's very little grass growth. This here is the fence line to the neighbours. Now I don't know if you've seen these images at the moment of these massive dust clouds that are moving across Australia. That is not natural. That is bad management. What happens if you have microbiology? They stick soils together, right? They make vomit and poos and weeds and mucus and all sorts of stuff and they stick soils together and create aggregate stability. These soils don't move in heavy rains and they don't blow. Right? So if your soil is blowing, you're lacking beneficial microbiology. So this, this fence line image happened the whole time. The neighbours just blew and blew and blew. <coughs> then they got some rain. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> So when someone asks you how much rain did you get last season, how much did you get? None. None? Oh, come on. 15 inches. 15 oh. inches. Something like that. Cool. When someone asks you that question, you want all to be able it. to say all of it. <laughs> all of it. And most properties, no. So on the news, they were getting rain and they were saying, oh, this is amazing. The dams are filling up. No, that is not good. Right, that soil should be absorbing and holding on to all the rainfall that they get. Uh, these guys ended up getting four inches of rainfall. The only place that they had any water sitting was where the fire was so hot that it created hydrophobic conditions. Right, it burned those soils. But apart from that, all that water went in, and they got some of the neighbours. Yay! Okay, I won't go on there. 